Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 143 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be talking about some things that I think you should know about and should care about. Uh, comments and reactions are welcome. You can send them to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and uh, you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. Uh, as always, if you do send me email, please include something in the subject line so that I know it's not spam, and uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I... I'm actually rather slow about dealing with email. All right, with that, getting to it. As always, whenever there's good news, I like to start with good news. And so we've got a little bit today. It's not the best of good news because there's a little bit of a dark side to it, but um, still. Last Friday, January 17th, Pennsylvania's voter photo ID law was struck down by a state judge as unconstitutional under the state constitution. Commonwealth Court Judge Bernard McGinley said the law unreasonably burdens the fundamental right to vote and that the state had no convincing explanation of why it would be necessary. Now, the legislative debate when this measure was passed in, uh, in 2012 was the same debate as has happened everywhere that this has come up, with the right-wingers claiming that it was necessary to prevent in-person voter fraud, while being forced to admit when they are pressed that there's actually no evidence that any such kind of fraud is actually occurring, and certainly not anything near to an extent that would justify the massive disenfranchisement of otherwise legal voters that this would entail. In fact, in the specific case of, of Pennsylvania, Slate.com came up with precisely five confirmed cases of all types of voter fraud, not just in person, but all types of voter fraud. While at trial over this issue, the state's own witnesses said that by their estimates, somewhere between 320,000 and 400,000 already registered Pennsylvania voters would be disenfranchised because they didn't have the required ID. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Space Cadet Corbett has asked the judge to reconsider while he considers his own options, which could include an appeal to the state Supreme Court. Uh, while considering that, he might want to bear in mind that this is the second time now that this same law has been smacked down by a state judge. Uh, Witold Walchak of the ACLU, which helped to lead the legal challenge to the law, said, quoting, the act was plainly revealed to be nothing more than a voter suppression tool. And uh, this is where the dark side kind of comes in. That uh, notion was given extra credence by the recently published research of sociologist Keith Bentley and political scientist Aaron O'Brien of UMass Boston. They found that the states that have enacted tougher voter ID laws in the past few years are the same states where both minority and lower income voter turnout had increased in recent years. When they look specifically at 2011, because many of these laws were passed in 2011, they found the three strongest common factors among those states were one, goppers controlled the state legislature and the governor's office. Two, they were likely to be swing states in the 2012 elections. And three, minority turnout had been up in 2008, and there was a high percentage of non-white voters in the state. In other words, as Salon.com headlined the story, the study confirms every bad thing you suspected about voter ID laws that they are nothing more than attempts by the right wing to hinder the ability of blacks, the poor, the elderly, women, and other historically disenfranchised and underrepresented, group, uh, underrepresented groups. It's specifically to try to keep them from voting. These laws are racist, they are classist, they are sexist, they are profoundly undemocratic, and they are bluntly un-American. Those who push them are only interested in maintaining their own privileged positions in society. I'd say that they should be ashamed, except their actions prove that they have none. Now, there is some feeling in some quarters that this decision in Pennsylvania will strengthen efforts in other places uh, to strike down or prevent the enactment of such laws, and that would be good news. All right, moving on, the fact is the good news just keeps on rolling in. Uh, 
Virginia Attorney General Mark Herring announced on January 23rd that he believes that his own state's constitutional ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional and that Virginia is joining two same-sex couples and asking a federal court to strike it down. It's a dramatic reversal from the uh, position of Herring's predecessor, Ken Cuccinelli, who once referred to same-sex marriage as, quote, nothing but self-destruction, not only physically, but of their soul. Uh, it stands as proof that, as the goppers keep telling us, when they want to strip away union rights or cut aid to the poor or restrict voting rights or whatever, um, elections have consequences. It's also a personal reversal for Herring, who, as a state senator some eight years ago, voted against same-sex marriage. Now, however, he says that Virginia has been on the wrong side of legal battles involving school desegregation, interracial marriage, and single-sex education at the Virginia Military Institute. He now wants Virginia to be on, quote, the right side of the law and history, unquote, in the battle over same-sex marriage. And he said, as Attorney General, I cannot and will not defend laws that violate Virginia's rights. Good for him and good for the future of Virginia. All right, we're going to follow up now with two updates on things I talked about last week. Uh, I'm going back over them and updating you because I think both of these are important enough to deserve a revisit. Uh, and the first of them actually, I suppose, is not so much a, um, an update as a backfill. Uh, and there are fact, two parts to the backfill. Uh, now to start, there's a basic point that you need to understand about the internet, which is, I mean, the thing is you probably know this already, but I'm just going to lay it out just to make sure it's clear. Uh, there are essentially, at the most basic level, two parts to the internet. There are content providers. These are the people who actually create the videos, the text, the websites, the whatever, create the stuff that you actually look at or listen to or read on the internet. Then there are content carriers. These are the corporations that own and control the networks, wired or wireless, over which that data travels, uh, over which that data then is transmitted to you. Now, you know, there are complications in the fact that a content carrier can also be a content provider. They can create their own content to send over their network, but that's not really important. The basic point of uh, saying that there are content providers and content carriers remains. Okay, last week I spoke about net neutrality, about the principle that all information transmitted on the internet is treated equally. And I also described the recent decision in federal court in D.C. that said that the FCC could not regulate broadband, which is, you know, high-speed internet, uh, could not regulate broadband the way the agency tried to do it. That decision essentially undermined net neutrality, as I talked about last week. Because the result of that court decision was that the handful of giant corporations such as Verizon and Comcast and AT&T that control the networks over which internet traffic travels could favor some content over others, which means in practice they could favor that content produced by other large corporations that have the bucks to pay for special treatment while everyone else would just have to wait until Verizon and Comzon got around to them if it got around to them at all, because now there's nothing to prevent them from saying to some content provider, um, we're not going to carry your content. As far as the U.S. is concerned, you're off the internet. Now, the first part of, this, of the backfill is that I said as a result of that decision, I said this last week, that unless something changes, the future of the internet can be found in the past. And I compared it to the argument over the fairness doctrine. Because time was short last week, I didn't get to explain that properly, so I want to do that now. The fairness doctrine was an FCC rule that essentially required broadcasters to do just two things. One, to cover some, in, uh, some uh, issues of public interest, including some controversial ones. And two, to do it in a way that overall their coverage is reasonably fair with a reasonable chance for all sides to be heard. Now, the Fairness Doctrine in some form was around for a long time. In fact, there was a version of the Fairness Doctrine in place before there was an FCC. Over the years, it existed in a number of different forms, but some form had been there. 
Well, as broadcast media corporations became more concentrated, more powerful in the 60s and the 70s, they started to complain about the Fairness Doctrine. They wanted it repealed and they spent years working on this. A main argument they used is that the rule was unnecessary because the broadcasters could be trusted to do this, to cover topics and to do it in a fair way, all on their own. Well, at the time, I was involved in efforts to maintain the Fairness Doctrine, and I wondered aloud why, if that was true, uh, these networks were spending so much time, energy, and money to repeal a rule that only had them do what they would have already done anyway. Well, finally, under the corporate capitalist friendly regime of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, uh, the Fairness Doctrine was repealed followed almost immediately by the explosion of right-wing talk radio, the virtual disappearance of even just liberal voices, and the emergence of overtly biased networks such as Fox. Which means I had the answer to my question, but I actually knew that was the answer all along. Okay, that's the past. As for the present, Randall Milch, Executive Vice President of Verizon, said this about the decision about that court decision. One thing is for sure, today's decision will not change consumers' ability to access and use the internet as they do now. Verizon has been and remains committed to the open internet that provides consumers with competitive choices and unblocked access to lawful websites and content when, where, and how they want. In other words, he's claiming, or he's trying to claim, that the elimination of net neutrality won't make any difference at all and Verizon, which brought the suit, spent all this time, energy, and money to get rid of a regulation that didn't make them do anything they wouldn't do anyway. As I said last week, we've been down this road before. We have to make sure that we don't wind up in the same place. But that, in fact, raises the second part of the backfill. This goes back to Milch's statement. Verizon remains committed to the open internet that provides consumers with competitive choices and unblocked access to lawful websites and contents when, where, and how they want. Now note carefully, note very carefully, that he declares a commitment to unblocked access, but not to equal access. That is, while he tries very hard to make you think that there will be uh, no, no changes at all as a result of this, he very carefully avoids any commitment to net neutrality, promising only competitive choices, which, we, as we all learned long ago, is corporate speak for pay up or give up. And the thing is, we truly have been down this road before. Remember when the P in PBS meant public broadcasting and PBS was going to be the outlet for all the previously unheard voices? Remember when UHF TV, and that's broadcast channels 1483 for you kiddies out there, remember when UHF TV was going to open up so many outlets for creativity and again for unheard voices? Remember that was also going to be true for cable TV and how for a time it actually was. Now, so far, the Internet has escaped the fate that has befallen these others precisely because of its, essent its essential democratic, even anarchic nature. Unlike broadcast media or cable, there are not a limited number of content providers available to any given users. You aren't limited to a dozen broadcast or even a couple of hundred cable channels. There are literally tens of millions of options out there for you. The whole Internet is available to you. But now we are faced with the very real possibility of that no longer being true, both literally in the sense of blocked access and more importantly because more likely, effectively, in the sense of delays, bottlenecks, and agonizingly slow transmission rates for unfavored outlets. We have in fact been down this road before. We have to make sure we don't wind up in the same place. Now, I should add as a footnote to all that, that net neutrality is not dead, just moribund. The court decision relied significantly on the FCC having classified internet service as an information service rather than a telecommunication service. And the court found that the regulations in question had treated outfits like Verizon as telecommunication services. Uh, so they said the, FBI, uh, the, the, the FCC cannot regulate them in that way.
So there's a couple of options. The FCC could try reissuing the regulations uh, while defining them, uh, defining these corporations as an information service. Even better, uh, since the court said it was the FCC's own classification that caused the problem, the FCC could just say, well, we were mistaken. These are telecommunication services, uh, reclassify them and reissue the regulations. An even better but far less likely alternative would be for Congress to pass legislation uh, enacting net neutrality into law and specifically giving the FCC the power to regulate corporations to that end. But in any event, I have to say, buckle up, kiddos. In a few years, this show may be the only alternative news source that you can get without paying extra for it. We'll get to our second update after the break. And we're back. Oh, now for another, uh, a rather update, and again, it's something I'm revisiting with more detail and some updates because I think it's that important. Uh, the update, uh, immediate update, is at the first stage of the agreement between Iran and six bullying, excuse me, major nations uh, about Iran's nuclear program has gone into effect. Iran has halted uh, its most sensitive nuclear operations while the U.S. and the European Union suspended some sanctions they had imposed on Iran. This is supposed to be followed by a long-term agreement uh, that negotiators are saying will take six months to maybe as much as a year to work out. Um, everyone agrees that the bargaining will be hard and a mutual agreeable pact hard to come by. Not only because of the complications uh, of national pride, which will, never, which will inevitably come up. This is going to come up. I mean, bear in mind that any agreement, in fact the current agreement, by definition, this involves Iran submitting to letting other nations determine its own energy policy. What would be the reaction here if the roles were reversed and there were six other nations who were bullying the United States and letting them decide our energy policy? But it also bears repeating that there are two major roadblocks to a long-term agreement with Iran. One of them is Israel. It's called the current pact an historic mistake and has repeatedly over the years threatened to attack Iran over Iran's nuclear program. And Iran, uh, Israel has for more than 20 years now claimed that Iran is just five years away from having a nuclear weapon. This is at the same time, by the way, that Israel itself has somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 nuclear weapons, a number just slightly fewer than the UK or France or China. Uh, and that, by the way, is a fact which the West, screaming about a purely hypothetical future Iranian nuke, never addresses. Now, the other related roadblock is a bizarre legislative coalition of right-wing fruitcakes and liberal cowards in the U.S. Senate. Uh, that coalition seems determined to pass a bill that would undermine the negotiations with Iran by imposing additional demands and the threat of additional sanctions, that is, moving the goalposts. It's related here because the uh, coalition is based on a commitment to Israel. Uh, a commitment on the right because of some fundamentalist notion that Israel must exist because of the conversion of the Jews leading to the second coming of Jesus. And among the liberals because they are terrified of crossing the rapidly pro-Israel lobby, AIPAC, and so losing both votes and contributions from the Jewish community and of being labeled anti-Semitic, which is the fate of anybody that dares to criticize Israeli policy. Well, I said it before and I'll say it again. Those people in Congress who support this bill are saying they do not want a settlement with Iran. They do not want peace. They may not want outright war, although I believe some do, but they do want to maintain the constant shadow of war, the constant risk of war, doing it the better to advance their own personal agendas. Last week I called this bill an outrage. It still is. Which, by the way, is why I feel so good about being able to say that there is good news on this. Ten Democratic committee chairs have come out against the bill, along with several other Democrats, including most recently Senator Patty Murray of Washington and, I'm pleased to say, Elizabeth Warren. 
The top leadership of the, among the Democrats is divided. Chuck Schumer favors the bill. Harry Reid and supposedly Dick Durbin are against it. Meanwhile, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and USA Today have all editorialized against the bill, as have some influential commentators, uh, including Jeffrey Goldberg, who's generally a staunch pro-Israel uh, defender. The overall result is that, according to columnist uh, Greg Sargent of the Washington Post, if current conditions remain, a vote on this bill is less and less likely. Now, outright defeat of the bill would actually be better, but I'll take no vote. That's what I get. By the way, as a quick fo footnote, among those who has been silent on the bill, but who in the past could be counted on to be as rapidly pro-Israel as the rest of them, is Ed Markey. All right, moving on from there, uh, very quickly, an edition of our occasional feature, Everything You Need to Know. This is where you can learn everything you need to know about something in no more than a sentence or two, sometimes less. In this case, it's everything you need to know about income inequality in just one sentence. According to a new report from Oxfam, the world's richest 85 individuals control as much wealth as half of the world's population, some three and a half billion people. And that is everything you need to know. All right from there, one of our regular weekly features, it's the outrage of the week. Now, you know, or you, you damn well should know, that access to legal abortion is being systematically strangled in the United States. In fact, in 2011 and 2012, states passed a total of 135 laws restricting access to abortion more than the total of the 10 years preceding. Now, among those laws in several states are ones that require forced ultrasounds. Women are forced to have an ultrasound before she can access abortion care. The lawmakers behind these bills are open about their purpose. They hope the ultrasound will make the woman change her mind about having an abortion. Which means, to put it another way, that they think that women are too stupid to understand what being pregnant means. Well, even beyond that, forced ultrasounds involve what Tracy Weitz, uh, she's the director of the Advancing New Standards in Repro Reproductive Health Program at, at uh, UCAL San Francisco. Uh, she described the highly specific and intentionally punitive provisions of forced ultrasound laws and how they present a real burden to women seeking an abortion. For one thing, for example, ultrasounds are normally done by a technician, but most of these laws require them to be done by a physician, in fact the same physician who's going to do the abortion. Now this not only contradicts best medical practice, it drives up the cost putting uh, the procedure beyond the, the reach of a lot of low-income women. Now, um, these bills also, these requirements also, by their very nature, intrude into the course of health care as determined by the patient and her doctor. And by the way, whatever happened to all the right-wing complaints about not having the government stand between you and your doctor? Except, of course, I forgot that that only applies when it involves uh, providing you access to health care, not restricting access to health care. In that case, having the government in there is just fine. The laws are an outrage. But the fact is, they've been an outrage all along. So why are they the outrage of the week? Well, because according to a comprehensive new study published in the journal Obstetrics and Gynecology, the overwhelming majority of women who seek an abortion do not change their minds after receiving and, re and viewing a sonogram, a sonogram being the image produced by an ultrasound. Researchers reviewed uh, nearly 16,000 visits to a provider which allowed women the option of having uh, an ultrasound. A majority of those women chose not to look, which only serves to point up the intrusive and manip manipulative nature of these laws. However, and more to the point, a little over 40% of the women did choose to view the sonogram. Among those women, 98.4% went ahead with the abortion, a figure virtually identical to the percentage of women who did not view the ultrasound who went forward with it. Um, put another way, of those women who did not 
view the sonogram, uh, 1% changed their minds and decided not to have the abortion. Of those women who did view the sonogram, 1.6% changed their minds. And as it turns out, those women who changed their minds uh, after viewing the sonogram were among those who had expressed mixed feelings about getting an abortion in the first place, who already had doubts about it. Among those women who expressed confidence in their decision, 0%, not one, changed her mind after viewing the sonogram. In other words, these ultrasounds have essentially zero impact on a woman's decision to have an abortion. They have all the intrusiveness, all the burdens, all the unnecessary expense, and all the sexist condescension about a woman's ability to make her own health care choices. The fact is that they are an outrage. And they don't even work one of the ways the right wing wants them to, which makes them even more outrageous. They are, if you will, the outragier of the week. All right, we should have just enough time for our other regular weekly feature. It's the Clown Award, and it's given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. This week, because time is short, I'm going after an easy target. Glenn Black. Now, there obviously could be any number of reasons for this, but uh, this is the one I've chosen because it's recent. You know of Bill Nye, the science guy, I'm sure. What you may not know is that he, of late, um, has become a leading voice in the scientific fight against creationism and in favor of the scientific principle of evolution. He's been using his celebrity and his ability to explain scientific concepts in a way understandable to non-scientists uh, in order to battle the ignorance that creationism represents. Well, this is where Black comes in. He played a clip of Nye telling creationists that it's fine if they want to live in an alternate reality, but don't make your kids do it. This, Blech insisted, put Nye on the wrong side of history and asked if in the future Nye, quoting him, is going to look like the people who threw Galileo out. That's right, Glenn Black says that Bill Nye, in standing against those who want to deny the reality of evolution, is just the same as those people who tossed out Galileo in order to deny the reality that the Earth goes around the sun instead of the other way around. They are exactly the same. One thing I think we can be confident will be said in the future, because it's already being said now, is Glenn Black. Oh yeah, that clown. All right, that's going to be about it for this week. Uh, there are all kinds of news things that you don't have time for, but I tend to go until next week. There's, uh, there's some updates, uh, uh, new news about global warming. Um, there's a lot of news about privacy, about the NSA, some of it good, some of it bad. But um, a lot of things we need to talk about, a lot of things that are important that I do promise to get to next week, a lot of things about the economy. More news, and more news than I can deal with in the course of one show. So you just have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. And for now, peace.